All right, so we're starting a new series uh, where we're going to break down movies, commercials, um, all sorts of stuff, but with the people that actually worked on it. So uh, the first one is going to be with uh, like an up and coming, um, just like starting. I just shot some small stuff like uh, the Hangover movies, uh, War Dog, Godzilla. Um, what else was there? Like, I don't know. Joker. Garden State. Garden State. Yeah, that's not another indie indie film small stuff this is the first episode of how they filmed that where we break down movies tv shows and commercials with the people who were actually there making it telling the real true bts the secrets of what happened on set and how they created these incredible filmmaking masterpieces that's the first take collapses to the ground which is what you see in the movie day three Perfect. And he just turns to Todd and he goes, all right, I think that's a wrap. And first up, we have the legendary DP, Lawrence Schur. And we're breaking down one of the most iconic movies, Joker. What's up, guys? Hey, hand this to me. <laughs> no, this is, you can't even look at this. What is this, Larry? I want to give it to you, man. I want you to, to flip through here. You got 60 seconds. I'm going to I'm gonna put a stop <laughs> okay, on it. what? Yeah, we just finished like a month ago. Can I show the, the front cover? No. Yeah, I just don't I know. I got a fake shirt. Oh, no, the <laughs> shots on the back. Wait, we got to find a way for You have to be at a, 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 a oblique angle to not... Uh, it says Joker... Folia du. Folia du. It means crazy for two. I just Watch. realized yeah, what I'm getting myself into. Yeah. You can't do this to me. <laughs> well, yeah, because if you stay too long, you'll know everything that happens in the movie. <laughs> yeah. We got to make sure... 60 seconds for real, eh? Yeah, yeah, here we go. Go. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. I'm wasting time. I'm wasting time. Oh my God, I'm seeing too much already. I feel like <laughs> this is the secret knowledge that uh, I'm not supposed to know of. Oh my gosh. What are we at? What are we at, Larry? 28 seconds. You it's might like... want to flip ahead. No, 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 no. You can't see, see any of this. Oh. All right, that's it. That's it. No more. No more. That's all you get. Oh, that's like, you can spend a whole day with that. You'll have a chance in a year and a couple months. When can we do that shot breakdown? We'll do it uh, November 1st. <laughs> All right, I'm here. I'm the coming back. The movie comes out in October. So we're going to talk about Joker. Let's start you with Joker, yeah. You just show me stuff that I'm not allowed to see about the future. We're going to talk about the camera that you used, the lenses that you chose, and we're going to break down a few of your favorite scenes because we want that secret knowledge. Sure. I want to give the audience a little bit of what I just got. A piece we'll of. go as deep as you want. Let's talk about camera. What camera did you guys shoot the Joker on? We and shot. Why? Yeah, we shot most of the film, 80, 90% on the Area Lexus 65. Mm -hmm. We started- The big guns. The big guns. We brought out the biggest sensor in the world. Um, I had shot that camera on Godzilla, Anamorphic. Another small time micro <laughs> yeah. indie film. Uh, and that also had, it already been out. You know, it was like a movie that had, you know, a film that had used that film, and I remember even Legendary at the time we did Godzilla, was like, no, we know this camera. But in a weird way, the camera was like, uh, it had like a stain on it. Mm, because it had done that movie, The Great Wall, <laughs> which was also a Legendary film. And they're like, yeah, we shot with For that big, dumb camera, and that movie failed miserably. <laughs> like, sometimes you're like, is it anamorphic that hurt the movie? Well, well, where this? did we... That's like one of my biggest questions, Larry, is like, so much money and time and some of the most talented people, filmmakers on earth, make something and it just doesn't turn out. And what... Well, what, I didn't what? do The Great Wall, <laughs> yeah. but certainly Legendary was like, this is not... like So they weren't 100% on board on shooting necessarily with this massive sensor. So you had they, to convince them? I had to convince them on Godzilla. Why, why were they... Just I think I think because it's like it's expensive. It has like a, a lot of media management stuff. So do we really need for. this? A lot of it question. is exactly that. It's fundamentally like, as Bob Weinstein once said, uh, a director friend of mine was like, "I need a million dollars to do reshoots." He's like, "Is it gonna make the movie better?" And he's like, "Yeah." He goes, "Will it make me more money?" And he goes, "I don't know." And he goes, "I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't give a shit if it makes the movie better. I want to know will it make me more money." And, which is always hard it's to say. It's all about the money. Yeah. So what what made you want to fight for it then? Well, I the minute I saw that huge sensor, it, it spoke to, and this is really why Joker, ultimately why I think we shot with it, was it spoke to this idea of, of portrait photography, of, mm. of that, you know, in intimate scenes between two people, yeah. the way you have like a large format still camera, Mamiya or whatever, I had a large format camera, 
in 120 or even larger film, 4x5 or, you know, Ansel Adams, 8x10. Yeah. That sensor and the f idea that you're shooting wide shots on an 80 millimeter or that kind of idea, I thought was gave an intimacy and almost a three-dimensional palette to the movie. Interesting. So the idea of shooting on, on Godzilla, we did an amorphic. On Joker, we knew we were going to shoot 185 from the start. It was not really a question between Todd Phillips and myself. What was what was the... We both came you know? to 185. Like, we had shot all the hangovers, 235, spherical. Rarely had shot had Todd shot uh, anamorphic. I think he did on Starsky and Hutch and maybe School for Scoundrels. But generally speaking, all the movies I'd worked with him, Due Date, all the Hangover movies, and War Dogs, all, all spherical. But together, we both were like, 185 feels like the movie. Maybe because we knew it was going to be a lot of close-ups, it mm. wasn't so much about scope as much yeah. as intimacy. That was We were in agreement there, but then film was really where we thought, this is what we're going to do. So what lenses did you end up with then? Our lenses were a mess. Our lenses are like... <laughs> That's what we like to hear. Yeah. You didn't Our have it all figured out, Larry? We had none of it figured out. Because, you know, early days in the world of Aries 65, because so much of Aries 65 then becomes about coverage. Yeah, you probably don't have that many to choose there from. There were even. very few choices, particularly in 2018 or 2017, maybe when I first started prepping the movie. We shot it in 2018. There's DNAs, which are great, but DNAs at times weren't fast enough, close focus enough. There were some issues like that. So I went to Aerie Rentals, where you get the cameras from, because uh, you can't buy a Aerie 65. You, you can't you guys, buy a 65. <laughs> yeah, you can't just go to the store yeah. and be like, oh, you, God, but a, a 65, please. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the way Panavision did, where they don't sell them. It's very proprietary. Freaking Aerie. Right. But they obviously sell LFs and mini course, LFs yeah. and all that. But at, at a 65, you still can only rent. Yeah. And and so that was a big part of it. Uh so obviously we had some DNAs. This 80 DNA, which is a really great lens, was a was a workhorse for us. And uh, I think we had a 28 DNA, and we had some other ones. But in between, it was honestly reverse engineering our camera package, our lens package, based on need. So mm. speed, what what is fast enough? Because we want to work a lot with available light. Okay. And in in locations where we didn't want to do a lot of lighting. Yep. Uh, close focus because we knew it was going to be an intimate yeah, movie and you want to be close and you want to be physically close because yeah. particularly since now you're shooting a, you know a 60 or an 80 mil lens two feet away yeah because it's a wider field of view yeah you want that to be able to close focus to two yeah. or whatever two feet yeah there's a huge difference in the feeling of like actually having the camera close or just being a little bit further away and zooming well, in I don't know if you guys know that <laughs> I, that to me is like there's a fundamental difference to the audience's psychology that's why we're on 16 mil right now because I want the people to feel like they're here <laughs> with right. us they're hanging out <laughs> that's exactly right um, and that was a big criteria it's like we knew physically the camera would be closer so the close focus matters mm -hmm. and so we had Ari uh, and my camera assistant, Greg Irwin, uh, uh, basically search out lenses that would cover the sensor and cover really for us 185, even though we shot the full 2.2 sensor, we knew we were mostly working in 185. Uh, and so we had Canons and we had Leicas and we had, we had this Nikkor 58, which even on the new Joker, and really, we bounced a lot of those lenses over the new Joker, along with some bespoke lenses that Otto Nemmons built that are these old Hasselblads that they now call Autoblads, which are like all full frame, yep. really close focus. They could be a little faster autos, but <laughs> they're working on that. But generally speaking, these sort of like lenses that we had, which ran all the way from like a Airy Signature 350 to a Leica 280 to a... Uh, like a 100, not like a 90 macro, 50 uh, Canon, it, it, you name it, right? 35 Canon CP. So when you're testing these lenses out, what do you look like? What's the, like, this is the one instead of this one? Vintage-ish, right? Which, what does that mean? It just means not perfect, right? And that was the specific look for this film. You needed it, to... I wanted it to feel like a large, large piece of, of like going into the movie was the movies representing 1981 Gotham, which is, you know, we were shooting in New York. Yeah. So I grew up in 19, you know, born in 70, 81. I know it vividly. I know what New York felt like. I was just outside the city in New Jersey. So I had a really good memory of that. So I wanted to feel like that kind of movie. So it's like, okay, what kind of lenses were built in that day? So not looking for super sharp new lenses, new glass, some of the older, that was a criteria. 
So looking for imperfections was a good thing. Yep. But really, a lot of it was also, oh, good, it's close focus, it yeah. covers. It's like, uh, just honestly, functionality. functionality. We just need to do <laughs> By the way, in a lot Not of Not everything ways, is that creative. <laughs> in a weird way, the functionality of lenses is a huge part of the choice, yeah. right? Sometimes the biggest decision. Functionality plays more of a part, in a weird way, of my lens choices than you would think. And I get a little bit like lens fatigue. There's mm. so many lenses. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And honestly, uh, it's so hard to differentiate them. And yep. there's not a tool to help you. So you end up bringing six sets into the lens, into the prep. And, and, and there's, you know, there's differences. But I get why Deacon stays with Master Primes. I get, before I went, you know, away from Panavision a little bit, it was such a beautiful thing to just shoot on Primos, Primo mm. Zooms. And I never had to make that decision ever again. Yeah. Now it's like 150 lenses <laughs> to choose from. It's a lot. All right, so we know what camera, lenses. Let's break down some of your favorite scenes or, I don't know, scenes that you thought were interesting. Before we get into yeah. your favorite scenes, yes. tell me a little bit about your philosophy, kind of your pre-production. Like you, you're starting to prep for a movie. How do you go about things? Because I know nothing about that and I think it'd be interesting. Yeah, here. so first step, get the script and then I read it of course that's usually that's important yes yes <laughs> uh and i immediately start thinking of i start basically two files right okay. i start a file that's very it's my the, my bible and it's basically i'm going to create a tool uh with the help of some guys that will help this a lot more but until then it's a very sort of manual process of like a word document or whatever mm. and i basically rewrite the script into a, each scene has each scene has a page Okay. Right. And 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 within it has all these categories. Yep. And those categories, I start taking notes right from the start. And that's high level stuff like feeling. It, look, it, like emotion. one will be just a, a category called creative. One will be camera, grip, electric, special so effects. Straight to the like. Yeah. If I feel how like, do we oh, do this? A crane shot. I'll just put crane. Okay. And a lot of it is just first instinct as yeah. I'm reading the script for the second time. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is just a is starting to build like a deck of visual references, right? Yeah. So back in the day, I would go to a used DVD store and I would rent or buy. This is way back in the day. I know, because I'm saying <laughs> DVDs. Yeah, well, it is. It's 20 years ago, easy, maybe longer, 25 years ago. Um, and then I would go to a bookstore called Arcana, which is in Los Angeles, still exists. And I would look for, you know, maybe photo books or, you know, sort of those kind of For references. Books. Anything I thought might be inspirational for the movie. And sometimes I'd buy a book that's just great as a piece of art. Yeah. That might have one shot that's referential. Yeah, but yeah. it was something, you know. Something to inspire you. If I was doing Dukes of Hazard, I went and bought like a, a book uh, about like, you know, that was all photography from the South, right? Yeah. Mississippi and just to get a vibe for things that might inspire me and, and show that. And then I would create screen grabs from the movies of things that, were conversation starters or inspirational shots or something that might help me start to organize my thoughts about how to shoot Vegas or how other people have shot Vegas so I could think about different ways of shooting mm. Vegas, whatever it would be. And then yeah. from that came this program called Shot Deck, this website called Shot Deck, which I started building simply because we, I needed it to yeah. exist in a way that was searchable and functional and scalable. And, and now I use that to basically do that reference stuff. There was no tool for you, so you just made it yourself. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I was like, and now you've given it, like, given the power to us mere mortals. I feel like that's, like, that's kind of what happened here. Well, because I figured if I needed it, other people needed that's it right, too. Yeah. And, 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 and we're also in need of a better, more efficient tool like that. But even today, like even for the new Joker, this happens on every movie. I'll think like, oh man, this movie doesn't exist on Shot Deck, so I'll break them down myself, right? Mm, so, yeah. you know, there'll be a brand new movie. I think we literally just released one from the heart, which is an old Francis Ford Coppola movie. Mm -hmm. um, and I broke that down for the new Joker and, and because I wanted it to exist. So it was part of the conversation. Right. Whether those images ended up really influencing the new one, in part, maybe they did. Mm. They became a conversation starter for me and Mark Friedberg, the production designer, and Todd yeah. as we scouted in those early days. Hmm. And so even if it's not sitting there as a reference that you're going to take on set and go, I want it to look just like this, 
it's just like brain yeah. food, you yeah. know? It, yeah. it, it's like dream food. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really the main thing. So what I'll do is I'll literally, and you can see in here. I can't see anything, Larry. It's just, I know. It's just, it's just dirt. It's just the sweat. But I, I, talk, just I think I explained to you, it doesn't record the dirt. Yeah, the people at home won't see the dirt. I mean, you can see how literally dirty it is, probably if you get the right angle. But I'll start a master deck that'll, let's say, be Romeo, which is the working title for, for the first Joker. And I'll start creating decks for locations. Wait, for hold sets. on. Where does Romeo come from? You mean? know, every movie generally has like a working title. Yeah. But, and, and where does Romeo? Well, the yeah. second one, the working title is Juliet. Okay. So that okay. it all okay. makes okay. sense. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you got a feel for it. Yeah, yeah I got, I got a little yeah. bit of a. Okay, sorry. So sorry only to interrupt Todd you. knows where Romeo came from, okay. but okay. it was called Romeo. And uh, so and this so, is what you're doing, like right? In so Pro. you can even on here, like if you go to all my decks, you can see like my master deck for Romeo. And in there, literally, I start with all kinds of things. I'll build a deck just for composition, one for yeah. tone, one for lighting, one for close-ups, one for composition overheads. And then Can I'll start building some, some things there. Yeah, so show composition or, you know, is just a deck that I started building from the start, mm. right? I can and right so, away. That's interesting. I can see. You can like, start to see some things. Of yeah, like, exactly. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so you'll see there's just like this shot from Dr. Strangelove was like a very early shot. Mm. I'm not sure. There's kind of a shot maybe in Joker. Yeah. But it just intrigued me yeah. as a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it was like hallways or reflections yeah. and mirrors that reflection and mirror shot never shows up in the movie yeah but it was just things that like often i'll start with browse shots i'll start with some movie i've never heard of and anything that captures my attention i'll just start to you know pick out and, and populate the deck sometimes they never get referenced right They're just things to sort of feed the it's brain it's interesting because if you showed me any one of those single frames i wouldn't think joker right away right but you show me this board i'm like oh okay i, I understand like what like um, i get the you know yeah so i do that basically for for all across the movie you know color references you know and and then it becomes something we share with each member of the crew so i can send this deck this master deck with all the sub decks to the production designer even to the AD has an account. To Todd, of course. And to they're adding their to own prop things. Masters. Well, because the props, I'll say, oh, you know, we need this journal and we'll have some references of journals or, you know, costume department. Every department has an account and then we share with them stuff that then they can add notes to or I can send this to Todd and say, hey, pick five shots that really grab your attention. And what's so effective for that is no matter who you are, even if you've got a lot of acumen in describing stuff, even mm -hmm. if you're working with a colorist that knows everything about color, yeah. sometimes showing the thing is going to be way faster to yeah. explain what you're looking for. It's hard to translate what's up here yeah. without showing, like trying to describe it in words. It could be interpreted Yeah, or you're like, oh, ways. I like extra headroom like Mr. Robot, but how much? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but if somebody starts like, if you say, hey, just find a bunch of compositions that you like or over the shoulders that you like, you're going to learn a lot if they build a deck of what grabs their attention. And you as a DP can interpret that much better because you start yeah. to like see, oh man, they're really gravitating towards closer overs, you know, where the, the person over the shoulder that you're focusing on is in the center of the frame, right? Those yeah. kind of over the shoulders. Yeah. Where the, you know, as opposed to spread overs, mm -hmm. you know, where you're spreading the frame across them. Yeah. And, it, and they may not even know that they're communicating all this information to you, but you right. can figure it out by all the ways in which they, they choose things. Working with Todd, do you think this, so I, I assume this came... This came early days. Todd and I would talk about this all the time. That this should be a thing? Yes. Or? And then when they had 5,000 shots, we would start to use it on, like, War Dogs was the first time. This was early, early beta when yeah, we yeah. just started coding it. And so those early days, it'd be like, oh, well, we're going down to shoot El Centro for our war stuff that's supposed to, and we also shot in Morocco. Oh, well, let's look at other movies that were shot in El Centro. So right. American Sniper or, you know, uh, a lot of these other sort of movies that take place in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so it was a great reference of like, oh, that's how they did it. Yeah. Let's try this differently. Let's yeah. not, you know. Yeah, I feel uh, like that collaboration is probably way easier for you guys now. Versus like when you started out working together. Well, every movie I'd worked on, at some point, it was like, remember that movie? Remember that shot? Yeah, yeah. And it just didn't... It, it, yes, you could go to Google, you could go to some other places. Yeah. But to get not just that shot, but other shots that were in the same 
setting or the same environment or the same shooting location. Yeah. That was what we were just typing fix. it out and looking it up instead of going to the DVD store, getting the DVD. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember when we were making Godzilla: King of the Monsters, we were like, we were having a conversation, me, the director, and the writer. Well, you know, this is one of those scenes that happens in every movie like this, science fiction movies, where it's a lot of jargon sitting around a computer, kind of like we are now. Yeah. And like, oh, well, you know, that's like basically in every born movie. Yeah. So he yells, the director yells out to his assistant. Go rent every Bourne movie and cut out every one of those <laughs> scenes. Well, we by five days later we'd already figured out how we were going to shoot it. It took yeah, you know, it's it's just too you, slow you at the at the ready. Yeah. So, um, so yes. And I gotta say, every like professional director DP that I've talked to recently, they all use Shot Deck. Everybody. Well, well, or they at least know of it and they're like, I've used it before for sure. But I think, in a way, because like I always say, well, Roger Deakins doesn't need this this site to get a job. Uh, it's really the filmmakers, students, you know, younger filmmakers. To me, that's the thing that I wish I had because yep. not just as a pitch deck tool or whatever it is, but really because it's just a place for inspiration. That's yep. still, I go on just about every day because now, because we have such a great team scaling it and putting all the, the movies in, there are movies that are curated by our team that I've never even heard of. So it's a discovery place for me too. Can, I find can movies. we get uh, our film on the movie song someday? What's that? I think, uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna, sick. I think yeah, I'm sick. sick. Yeah, maybe, yeah maybe it's a movie. It's, it's a movie. As long as it's, it's a movie. It's a proper movie. It's more than 80 minutes it's, long. It's a proper movie. It's good. Yeah. All right. We'll get it up there. We curate That's a maybe. That's a maybe. Yeah. I mean, for what I saw in the trailer, it's, it looks like it's got some great images. That's yeah, let's get some Let's get some of your the most memorable, favorite, whatever, something something scenes going here. Yeah, so... A good example of, you were asking about lenses before, and even the choice of lenses, and even when we were talking about proximity, you know, the opening of Joker where he's, we find him in his, sort of the, the employment center where they send the clouds out, and he's putting on his makeup. Mm -hmm. This proximity thing, you know, this lens here on this shot is our 58, which is like our favorite lens, right? So the 58, it's a Nikkor, it's a T13, super fast, close focuses to, I think, 11 inches so, so you're real close really then. close this is probably 18 inches mm. but that intimacy that physical proximity yeah. to Joaquin here makes a huge difference it's like a weird reaction to this, these shots where you're kind of like you're kind of like disturbed by it but it's especially because you're so close you would never be that close right. to somebody doing something like that well it's yeah like, because like really we open the whole point is like we're telling the story of Arthur Fleck so everything is about his world. So even the guys that are around talking, mm -hmm. you know, all the sort of other clowns that are getting ready, they're all in the yeah. periphery, right? Yep. So everything here is meant to stay with Arthur, mm -hmm. physically close to him. Yeah. When we cut to the next scene, which is when we find him out now in Gotham Square, you know, which is like Times Square, uh, with his going out of business sign, we now make conscious effort to get further away, mm -hmm. right? Like now he's part of a much bigger world. We're distant from him and seeing the world the way others see him, right? Yeah. Which is just like a speck, a fleck, yeah. for that matter. Yeah. Uh, just in the middle of a sea of, of other people, right? So hence longer lenses, further away. Mm -hmm. So now, now we shot with multiple cameras as opposed to the single camera. Obviously, once you get two or three feet from somebody, it's going to be hard to shoot many, yeah, multiple, many yeah. multiple cameras. But interestingly enough, this over the shoulder generally was shot at the same time as this. We would cross shoot a lot. Huh. Yeah. And that's just for a performance sake? To just so that can't... Joaquin didn't have to do it a lot of times. Yeah. It's also anything Joaquin did, never rehearsals, nothing like that. You were seeing it for the first time live. So you just wanted to make sure if he did it once... You and he it. never wanted to do another take. We got it. So I would always... That must have been an experience. Oh, it's so fun. And That's even really more... Cool. This new one's even more like that. Oh, so it's the best thing about it because he's such a great actor. But it's also exciting. It was exciting, I think, even for, for Lady Gaga, for Stephanie, to be in this environment where it is like shooting something live in a way yes, yeah you put all it's like a performance in a different kind of way you're it's, not you it's know super super fun way to make a go, movie. go back and i've heard you talk about the the tear oh, yeah. that 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 well that's a good example though right now we did shoot this probably three times but yeah. on the second take first of all he's he's like ripping his mouth apart right yeah. which obviously 
is is Probably very well that too many times. <laughs> yeah, and this this little tear of makeup that fell down his face. I just remember when we shot that, thinking, "Wow, if that doesn't make the movie, I'd be like, yeah, that, that would be crazy. That was incredible." I mean, everyone sort of looked at each other like, "That was cool. That was like, magic." Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we expected. would think that you guys did that on no, purpose. No, no, that was for sure planned. It's got some symbolic significance that they thought yeah. of beforehand, and they're geniuses. <laughs> no, the symbolic significance, which is like in this shot here, is I remember seeing this meme online. Where and you can kind of see it here, where those two eyes, and the and this little like shadow of the thing, yeah, look like the Batman. Uh, and I've yeah. seen it, and I go, wow, that does really look like the two eyes of the slit. Sorry, was this planned? No, <laughs> but that's a perfect example <laughs> of the amazing. internet creating something where I'm like, God, I wish I could say uh, that was yeah. planned. Because you really that's start to see good, it, but I go, yeah, no, that's no, just... No, I'm, that's all I can see no, is that. No, of course, that's just you the internet. You guys are geniuses. No, How did you yeah. come up with that? That's, oh, that's no, cool. I love that. The is, is undefeated. <laughs> uh, yeah, in that regard, I was like, that's pretty cool. I should that's take really credit cool. for that. No, no, that was not planned. Oh, no, for sure. Larry, um, yeah. But anyway, so in this, the whole you know, idea behind this scene was to put ourselves at a distance, see him as he's seen in the world. So we're shooting with three cameras, long lenses, even zooms now so that we can get even further away on long lenses. You're shooting multiple cameras because you can now because you're farther or because just functionally having to in that location, whatever, it's, whatever. You know what it is? It's also because you can. It's something you yeah. can see in Ridley Scott, oh, Tony Scott, of course, is one of the f benefits of being on longer lenses is they don't get in each other's way. Yeah. And the nature of how we shoot anyway, it's not like we suddenly change everything when we go in for a close-up. Mm -hmm. We just keep shooting. And so we're not doing a lot of cleanup. We're not changing. We're not bringing in a bunch of lighting. Yeah. So we can shoot something on a very long lens in a close-up as well as something wide at the same time and if they stay out of each other's way. And yeah. so Ridley Scott will do it with eight cameras, you know, and he'll shoot entire scenes head to toe and get basically every piece of coverage by just just shooting with such long lenses yeah and i love it we started doing that with todd and i going back to due date and the hangovers and we just like some of that long lens style yeah so in this case this hero shot here of him is you know is with a crane sort of away from the other cameras on a longer lens like the 150 yeah or even this shot might be on the 280 but even this shot here is at least as long as the 150 Similarly, you can sort of feel the sort of separation from us from him. Yeah. And the idea was to take it all the way through there. And also there's a, there's a verisimilitude that happens when you're shooting on a longer lens further away, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's the fly on the wall perspective yeah. that I think really, really has a psychological effect on the audience. You know, where you, you feel further, because you're further away, you feel like you're witnessing something the way we witness. Yeah. What's happening over there? Those yep. kids are chasing somebody. What is that? Yeah, yeah, So yeah. the further away, as opposed to if you have, like, the, the um, you know, the complete freedom to put the camera anywhere, which we do because we're making a movie, mm -hmm. it just has a little bit of a different psychology. Yep. Um, and the only time we break that, so now we're traveling on a Grip Tricks, which is, you know, like a, a little electric cart, and we have a small jib arm with a stabilized head. So this is one camera there and we are leading the other can so this is a stabilized head here this is another camera uh on a on a steady cam but also you know a longer lens and it's not until we get into the alley mm. and it's not until even after the alley that we finally break and go back to a wider lens and it's only when he's on the ground after the kids have beat him up and that's because it's his perspective or? It's now, like, he's now alone because they've left him. Yeah. And we're now trying to get right back to the sense of connection with this with this sad man who's, yeah. you know, who's just trying to get by and he's getting st signs stolen and mm -hmm. he's getting beaten up and yeah. all this sort of stuff that's going to sort of put us in, in his frame of mind. Mm -hmm. this, this overhead shot here, oh, you know, in a way, maybe it's like, I do remember consciously thinking, well, we're not making a comic book movie. Yeah. But one thing I appreciate about comic books and certainly graphic novels is that you are telling the story frame by frame. Yeah. And even though we don't use storyboards, we're not big on that. We do shot lists. Mm -hmm. I did like the idea of like cr trying to find in every scene a frame that could help tell the story. Yeah. And so this would be maybe it's a little bit Dutch. 
maybe in the style of a comic book, but subtly. There's mm-hmm. a later shot that when the when you know young Bruce Wayne dies in the traditional you know scene where his parents get shot in the alley, that we sort of repeat a little version of this shot as well. But this little shot here where the camera pulls away from him is we're back to that 58 millimeter. The favorite. Ah. So this is a low techno crane. It's like the techno crane 30, I think, if I recall. Mm-hmm. Super under You're super low. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like we may have even we did this a lot on the new movie, but we may have even done, which is sometimes you have to do, is basically flip the camera upside down so the lens is even lower on the ground because even if you put it in low mode yeah. on like a Libra head which is what this is it still doesn't get you low enough so you can undersling it and sort of like get it even even further yeah, low such a good perspective I love it you know what's so weird about this shot and I, I, you see right here mm-hmm. flower you know water comes out of it mm. right yeah when we were shooting it, because we were rushing, because we didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. We were barely going to get this shot to make our day. So it, you're in the heat of the moment. Yeah, I'm just trying to make sure technically we got it. We get enough takes. That little bit of water that comes out, I never saw when we were making it. Oh, really? I only saw it when I saw it on the God, big screen. Such a cool, like, happy I know. accident. I God. was like, oh, my God. There's, like, literally, like, a squirt thing coming out of his flower. And I, it was only until seeing the movie on the big screen when I was color timing And it. nobody planned for that? Nobody. No, no, that. Obviously, there's water in there. But what's funny is it was something between Todd and Joaquin. Interesting. That he never had to communicate to me. Yeah, because... Because it, it didn't really didn't matter for, the, for, like, you know. But and, and because we're pulling back and we're getting further away and yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it on a monitor yeah, on the set yeah, to yeah. operate... Yeah. I just never noticed it. That's so cool. Until it was, <laughs> nice little until surprise. It was yeah, it was great. I was like, oh, that's a nice touch. Yeah. Um, oh, that's such uh, great scenes. For you. Like, uh, that, that, some of those scenes are like, as soon as somebody says Joker, like those scenes, like they're just like burned in your brain. And if you go back to that original Bible that I talked about, mm-hmm. those were some of the earlier notes, right? Like, um, you know, let's shoot longer lenses, multiple cameras. I think I even had in there like add a third camera on this day. You know, uh, add grip tricks because I knew he'd be running and we'd have. Yeah. So all those sort of early days of like even figuring out special equipment, I would put in early in the Bible. And they, mm. the Bible never, never stops. Yeah. The Bible continues all the way through shooting because that's what we use to organize our thoughts the whole way through. And that's the Bible is to keep things cohesive so it doesn't feel like everything's the Bible disjointed. Is like, or... It's honestly like a drop box for ideas. So I never erase anything in the Bible. I might exit out. Right. I'll create a shot list, and then when I when I have time with Todd to create a new shot list, I keep my old shot list, and then I write Todd's shot list or I write a new shot list. But it just it's a depository for like. So I always remember what my first idea was, yep. and then I always have just a bunch of information. But but functionally, it becomes the first start of like creating a special equipment list because yep. invariably. You're organizing the whole movie, mm-hmm. the AD, the line producer. Everybody needs to know how many crane days you need, yep. how many extra camera days you need. Do you need special lenses? So it's just, it's it's a functional it's piece. It's a lot. Of, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> In a movie, it's like half the time. I'm going to go back to shooting my YouTube yeah, videos exactly. now. Yeah, <laughs> It's a lot of lists. My gr- I have a gorilla pod. <laughs> i got a microphone, 60 to 35, hey, A7S III. Yeah, I have to think a lot about like what I'm <laughs> Exactly. You got to call the line producer. Yeah. Can I get this approved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Can a I... lot of moving parts in this. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an undertaking. Yeah. Every movie in terms of the logistics, and so a lot of your job is logistics during prep. Yep. Because that's really what you're spending most of the time doing is making sure you, everything's prepared for the day of shooting. Yep. And then the day of shooting is pure fun and creativity mixed with abject, like stress and fear yep. of like one failing and two like running out of time because yeah. time is Always. your enemy when you're shooting yeah yeah that's the one thing that i learned from the the feature film that we did was that like if you have the logistics and all that stuff set and you're good with that then there's room for like the art that's artistry so and all that but if you don't have the the logistics and all that no chance for artistry no well, chance that's a, that's exactly the, that's a perfect way to describe it and a really good point because even that goes towards flexibility, right? If you make a plan, you could throw that plan out. Yeah. But because the plan was made under a time of less stress and mm-hmm. more time, yeah. that's that idea of like longer lenses, this and that, yeah. right? 
that that will still come through the next plan when you have to throw it all away because the idea, the emotional idea where you have time to think about it, that's the most important thing to come across. Yeah. So when everything changes, you still want that to be, to you know. And I'm sure fun. working with Joaquim, like, things aren't always planned. No. <laughs> and so, like, you have to just, like. No, and you throw, and also you don't have control, right? One of the first notes I made about this shot, which is, like, the wide shot, and this yeah. whole scene was, like, noon, bright sunlight, sweating, like, but again, I didn't have control of the weather. Yeah. And we're not going to, like, wait till it's a sunny day. And, you know, and it rained halfway through the scene. So you got cloudy, moody. I got like. cloudy, but also it was like, oh, shit, if the rain comes, then I'm yeah, really yeah, screwed. Yeah. So, like, I, and the sun came out at a point, and all yeah, the things yeah, and that all stressed over. you out. Yeah, yeah. You could just go, I can't control these things, so that's now not going to be part of the plan is yeah. that it's a sunny day. Yeah. But that's fine because, in a way, it's better. And yeah. sometimes that's the best thing that happens yeah. for you. Yeah. All right, let's move to the next scene. Sorry, guys, for the longest video ever, but I think, well, uh, no, I think this I is worth you don't it. Edit these we're things? like, we're 40 minutes Wait into this. Wait a second. We're just going to put this, the whole thing uncut. <laughs> I was told there'd be editing. <laughs> I can talk underwater. No, I under love this. I don't, even, I don't even care if I love this. This is awesome. This is so good. Yeah. So this is a good Tell example of also just plan versus trying to figure it out you know there's in every movie certainly that i've done there's always scenes that are sort of logistically the thing that you keep kind of returning to right like there you're are, like how are we going to do how this? are we going to so do here's this? the idea we want to do but how the heck do we do that exactly and so this is obviously an incredibly pivotal scene in the movie where he's just gotten fired from haha's after the gun falls out of his pants in the hospital with the kids and we find him on a subway these kids are picking on a girl. They end up starting picking on him. He shoots two of them, chases one into an alley. It's like changes his yeah. path, right? Mm -hmm. It's literally the most important pivotal moment in the scene. And when Todd and I talked about it, besides the logistics stuff, he said, you know, I just want it to feel a bit like a fever dream. Mm. And me, having grown up in Jersey just outside of Manhattan and riding on a lot of subways, but also prepping the movie, you're riding on subways. Yeah. You're sort of always obsessed with how subway light changes. Yep. Sometimes you go through a tunnel. Sometimes you go through a station. Yep. Sometimes the lights turn off. And this idea of fever dream, I kept thinking, well, I want full control over this subway. Yeah. And Which logistically is tricky. Well, it's impossible except if you build the subway. Car. Yeah, so you built the subway station. <laughs> and all of it, and all of it, everything. Your exactly. own. <laughs> we, built, we built a mile and a half of yeah, track. Yeah, yeah, you we, kept going there. Yeah, 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 all those oh, yeah, things. That's sure. exactly how you do it. Yeah, That's Hollywood, guys. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, you can take over a subway. There's like one track in New York that you can actually ride. Oh, really? And we shot. Like later when he shoots the cops and all the other jokers are in their masks yeah. and He's trying to sort of get to Murray Franklin. That we shot on a real subway. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, and that was going back on the same track. Yeah. And if you wanted lights to go off and on, you literally flipped a light switch. <laughs> so you had somebody in another car with like a master switch, and you go like, kill him, and they go tick, 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 like this. And that's how you like control the lighting, but you don't control anything else, No right? fanciness, just... <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you, have, you basically have to reset. It's like doing a real live yeah. driving shot. And... and Intuitively, Todd and I were like, that's not going to work for this scene. There's too much important acting going on, too much control. Right. So then the idea is, okay, well, you take a subway car, you put it on stage, yep. you put black out there, mm -hmm. you put some chase of LEDs, you make it feel like... And that yeah. also has worked. I've yeah. done it. It's been done in good movies. Yeah. But for me, it was still feeling like it was going to feel a little cheap yeah. and a little bit compromised. It's a little too poor man's. Yes. A little bit. Yeah. And also, blue screen would have sucked. Yeah. Because then suddenly, all you're feeling is the, the artifice of the stage. Yeah. Particularly for his performance. That's what I was going to say. For the actor, like, first time going on a, uh, like, going to a volumetric wall, and, like, I, instantly I realized, for actors, this is incredible. Like, yeah. to see, to be able to, like, be in the space versus just a green screen or blue screen behind you. Like, that it's, changes everything for actors. It changes everything. It's kind of the most important. The thing that makes it the most value, yeah, right, yeah. is that suddenly they don't feel like they're in a movie. They can feel like they're on a real subway car. So did you guys put volumetric, like so, volume, whatever, so this virtual was like they, And this is also one of the things that is tricky about, you know, being a, a professional cinematographer on, let's say, bigger movies. 
the logistics, making the special equipment. This is yeah. all part of the job. It's yeah. all the nature of the beast. But also kind of like bartering and negotiating for things that weren't part of the original budget. Mm. So the first step is like, I think we should build a volume. Yeah. Second step is, no, we can't afford it. This is what's <laughs> in the budget. Third step is, how do we afford it? Yeah. Fourth step is, we'll sh- kill a, sh- a shooting day. Okay, we'll do that. Fifth step is, find the PRG panels and negotiate with them to put it in New York, which is very expensive. Yeah. And then start like literally, this is when you become an engineer along with like the LED guys at PRG, you start figuring out how many panels we'll need, yep. how big it's going to be, how it gets rigged. Then the line producer goes, this is getting too big. We can't afford it. Figure <laughs> out another way. Then you fight some more. And you go back and forth like this problem for solving. like a month and a half. That's, and it's all, so much of filmmaking is just problem solving. Like, That's how it. do we like, you know, and like, yeah, there's an aspect of like creativity in that. But it's just like, how do we make this happen? It's the best part of the job. I mean, the creativity is, of course, awesome. Yeah. But in a way, and it's the best part about the crews that, that, that we're able to work with. And to me, everyone who goes into filmmaking generally has that spirit yeah. of like a can-do spirit and a problem-solving yeah. spirit. Like everything is like improv. You know, in yeah. improv, it's like yes and. Because mm-hmm. the minute you say no, everything stops. Yeah. I feel like everybody I work with and everybody who I've worked with over the years their general attitude towards life is yes. Yeah. And that's what happens. So it's like, okay, how do we make this work? The next step here was, well, how do we get plates? Yeah. Because in order to put something on the volume, you need plates. Yeah. The subway... Plates are what's actually showing up That's on exactly the right. So now we need the path that they're traveling on that's going to go in the windows outside of, their, of the car, which is now a, a box sitting on stage. Yeah. And the subway... People in New York were like, well, you can't shoot plates anymore since 9-11. Huh, yeah. Interesting. So I started trying to shoot plates with my iPhone and then like a better camera out the window, but they weren't working that great because you couldn't shoot them like as a yeah. as like with enough to yeah. like put on this. Yeah. But they were great references. Yeah. So this is where again collaborators like our VFX supervisor Edwin, we both were like, Well, how do we do this? So then we thought, well, what is movies except for 24 still frames a second so we started going to subway platforms and made a panorama so we shot we'd walk two feet to the right shoot another frame (laughs) two feet to the right shoot another frame just straight up photos that's it just a huge panorama that was like four seconds long if you treated Uh, each one like a frame and then it's looping or and then we put it into a timeline and then we put five timelines one was like a sodium vapor subway station one was a white subway tiled station mm. one was just a sea of fluorescence so you get there were all just looks. fake fluorescence made in photoshop and then we could basically in real time push a button and change what the background was while he was performing so like here is a, is a scene where they actually pull up to the subway and you can see in the background here the subway the plat like so now we're pulling up to a station and mm-hmm. you start to see it slow down yep that's literally the video content player we like are manually slowing it down <laughs> and then stopping it and that's just a still back there yeah and then that woman gets off the, the the station and we ramp it back up until it gets back up to speed and then here those lights going off and on we're doing on a dimmer of yeah. course and we're just killing them yeah sort of in real time, not mm-hmm. on any sort of like cue that's been set. Just based on feeling or? Just watching the scene. So this was all shot single camera. Jeff Haley was our operator. Uh, again, this is the 58, our favorite lens. And uh, and and now we have full control. So mm-hmm. I can control the lights inside and turn them off and on at, at will. I can also control what's outside those, those. So as they start to take off and now they're back up to speed and the the train's moving along, you, you, I can now change it to a white tile station. Yeah. I could change it. I could turn the lights off to create tension and yep. mood and all that stuff. And so it was like... <sighs> we were magic. Yeah, we were sort of DJing it. the scene as we were making it. So all those like little yeah. fluorescents out there are just still, still shots on a timeline. Now, uh, when you see that, you see some of it, do you see... Do you see what we see or do you see it as like, well, those are fake or like, no, because you, you've done it so well that you don't even see that. Oh, it's just a photo. Yeah. I mean, I think the hardest part was 
will Todd be happy? Yeah. And will Joaquin be happy? Because Todd right. hadn't really done this before. Right. And and I sort of pitched it, not necessarily knowing if it would work. Mm. So we only had the night before to actually finally see this timeline idea. And what we learned is it didn't look Sorry, right. Sorry, you had night before? The night before. <laughs> and that's when they not finally... Not months before. Well, yeah, because, not... <laughs> no, no, no. Because first of all, they, every time, every day you have this equipment there is like $100,000. Casual. And again, the yeah, producer yeah. was like, we can't afford this yeah, months yeah. ago. So so every single moment mattered. So it was like, I don't know, 5 p.m. the night before we were shooting where we realized there's something about the background that doesn't look right. Mm. And we realized it was missing motion blur. Ah, so yeah. they had to like yeah. add motion blur overnight and yeah. then reprocess it. So it wasn't until the morning of shooting that we could finally go, is this going to work or not? Yeah. Um, but what was great is Joaquin... And I mean, when you were on it, you felt motion sickness. You felt like you were on a subway. Really? And Joaquin loved it. And a scene that we had two days to shoot, we basically shot in a day. So it also saved that. The logistics, too. and then you have more time for artistry. <laughs> That's exactly right. And it made the whole shooting of it way more seamless and mm. allowed us 360, and we could just keep him in the performance and really make a difference. And I yeah. think that that's a combination of technical stuff helping, hopefully, you know, the artistic side of mm-hmm. it in a really good way and ah, so good. the negotiating and the sort of like the bigger part of or one of the biggest parts of of being a cinematographer which is collaborating with people and yep. and working with people where you don't kill each other it kind of makes me happy that you're saying things like we didn't have budget <laughs> well there's never by the way there's never a budget big enough every movie I love I've it. done 200 million dollar movies three times they still, there are uh, still things where you're you like, it. you can't afford it. Trust me. You can never, there's not a movie that has I ever been it. like, anything you want, boss. But, it, you know, a lot of times for, you know, my, my like level of filmmaker, it's like, well, if I had, you know, we could do whatever we want. But yeah. it's like, it's nice to know that like, no, it's always, there's always going to be limitations. It's always going to be the same for sort sure. of problem solving. A little bit different, obviously, but like, man, yeah, it's, I love it. It's well, good. the worst part is I don't have the if I had, because I can't use that excuse. Yeah, I yeah. can't even go, like, oh, if I only had one Now more. it's just a test of are you good or not? That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Now there's no excuse. Yeah. It's like, I can't believe they made such a shitty movie for $200 million. <laughs> yeah, that that for sure, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure has been said many times. Not about this one. All right, let's let's go to the last last one. Uh, we we got we're at fifty two minutes now. This You're has not. Been great. There's editing. Right? No, 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 no editing. editing in YouTube. <laughs> you see how the sun went down and it, yeah. it, it went by. We can we can adjust the, the ND just a little bit, but we're good. We're good. Oh, you guys don't have like an app for that. No. This scene, right? So this is like a little scene post killing those three guys, the Wall Street Three, as we would say on the call sheet. Um, he then runs out of the. He runs out of the subway. He first he has to chase down this one guy mm-hmm. and, and make sure he's not going to tell anyone. Take him out. So he ends up. So this is a transition. So we're on stage. This is now our stage, and then you can just see an intercut of real subway car. So this is stage, real subway car. So that little right. cut right there went from stage on one cut. A real subway car in the other. So this is real subway car. That's real subway car. And now we're on a real subway platform to make this transition yeah. happen. Um, and then he basically shoots that guy and then runs to the bathroom. And the bathroom, obviously, That's uh, an iconic people scene. have talked about a lot. But this scene, there was something I really was interested in um, in shooting in this little like chasing scene that on paper is a little bit of just exactly that. It's just transitional. It's just a way to get him to the subway. Yeah. And I remember because on like the second or third day of shooting in the alley outside of Ha Ha's, this shot here, right, mm-hmm. is the third day of shooting. Okay. Right, end of the day, we've already shot inside and it's Joaquin kicking something behind a dumpster. The script says he's kicking something. Is it a dead animal? Is it a person? Is it a trash bag? We have no idea. Mm-hmm. That's the first take. He basically tears his his like ACL, ACL yeah. yeah. And he basically collapses to the ground, which is what you see in the movie. 
And then he says... Wait, so he actually got her and collapses, or he just turns... This is what you see here. He day goes, three. Day three. Perfect. And he just turns to Todd and he goes, all right, I think that's a wrap. We end up shooting another take with his double. Didn't work. But what we realized, because Joaquin would never tell anyone, you see him grabbing his knee? Yeah. He fucked his knee up bad. And he lived with that busted knee the whole with movie. The whole thing. So and all now, the running scenes with all the big stuff. shoes. Up. So cut to this scene, and it's like a Friday night. Everyone's tired. And Todd, God bless him, is like the perfect... Uh, like, he has a real keen sense of what he needs and what he doesn't need. Yeah. But he's also just, like, he's, he's, he, we don't shoot long days. We don't shoot a lot of, I like, like that. you know. Yep. So it's a little bit of, like, and on this day, I remember him going, God, I, do we need the scene? And I'm like, I, we need the scene. Partly because I was like, I think we need the transition for the, like, what I would say would be, like, an emotional, like, energy burst yeah. between the two scenes. Mm-hmm. But he was making an argument like, but I could cut this out of the movie and we probably still would work. Yeah. And this is where a little bit of my selfishness was like, yeah, but I had this idea of like this shadow on a wall. It was like this idea from early days that I still want to accomplish. But also in the Bible, it's in the Bible. But also (laughs) I was like, I was like, I think you could shoot this scene, all of what we need this day, which was a whole day of work in four hours. So I said, if you can give me four hours. I'll do everything we need. And I we created it all, me and my gaffer, mm. Steve Ramsey, and all my whole team. We basically figured out a way to leapfrog every shot we needed on this night exterior mm. so that we could finish before lunch. Yeah, yeah. And he's also like, and, and Joaquin can't run. And so I'm like, well, he doesn't have to run at high speed because the nature of how we're going to shoot it, yeah. we'll never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, and so I say to Joaquin, I go, don't worry about it. You can run at whatever speed you want. Yeah. We're going to shoot it with two cameras leading you a wide shot with the crane on a stabilized head and then a longer lens at the same time. And he goes, and I go, just uh, let us set the pace with the camera car. <laughs> He's First take, he just takes it. off. He's like, there's no, it, it doesn't matter if he literally was like, he couldn't walk. <laughs> when the camera goes like action, yeah. there's no stopping him. And there's, it's like every bit of pain either goes away or he yeah. suppresses it because, and then even after the first take, I'm like, you never have to run that fast again. Every take Still is faster that, yeah. and faster and faster. <laughs> and it's insane. funny because the inspiration for that shot, not that you know we took it exactly, but I remember Todd and I both were like, this leading shot, which is really an emotional frame in the movie of him running mm-hmm. towards camera and really like yeah. almost releasing it. Mm-hmm. Our reference there was that this is America, Donald Glover, you mm. know, uh, Charles Gambino. Yep. Even though if you went to that Charles Gambino shot, which is awesome, by the way, it yeah. lasts forever. Yeah. It's not the same angle. It's yeah. not that. Yeah. It was the emotion of that shot that yeah. we really There's wanted. something that, there. That was like a talking point for Todd and I. How did Todd feel after then once you guys did this? Was he like, I mean, it's oh, in the movie. For, yeah. If, it, if, it, if he was like, I don't need it, it wouldn't be in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Even, if the, shot, time even if the shot's cool. <laughs> no, I think he was just, it's like, it's to some extent, it's not even... It's the part of the job is like recognizing yeah. that like on this day, the best thing I could do was be fast, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I and then for me it was like, could I be fast and also get some of the stuff I want to yeah. accomplish creatively? But the speed was more important because yeah. it, it was dealing with like you know, jo- Joaquin and Todd both were at a place. This the the movie's very exhausting, particularly for Joaquin. Yeah. Where you know, you could make an argument to get rid of it. And, and, and yeah, do that. yeah, but instead it was like, okay, I could be, we're fast tired. Let's just it's get hard. that. Sometimes that, oh, that man, happens, yeah, I can only man. imagine. And, and particularly when you're outside in the elements, when we're inside, we could go, we're tired yeah, and yeah. come back the next day and do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, when do. you're out doing the location stuff, you know, you're not coming back the next yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. You gotta get done. Yeah. Man, Larry. All right. We're at, we're exactly 60 minutes. Is that what Sick. you needed? That's ex- that, that, that was yeah. it. Is that how YouTube works? <laughs> yeah, that's 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Has to like, 60 it, minutes. Oh, no, I thought it just shuts down. The whole site <laughs> yeah. shuts down. No, you can put minutes. more ads on it after 60 minutes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Good. Dude, thanks so much for uh, doing this with me. Uh, I'll be back when uh, Fully part two is, is out. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't, I can't wait. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for Listen. your generosity, your time, and thanks for making freaking Shot Deck. Hey. Thanks for using it. <laughs>
<laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for. Do, do we have, are we, are we gonna give him like a code or something like that? Is there like a yeah. like a free trial or something like well, that? Well, there's a free something? trial. You don't even need a credit card to okay, do okay. two week free trial. But we'll give a discount I'll code. I'll try to convince him for a discount. Oh no, there'll be a discount. Oh, okay, okay. We'll give a really easy. That was easy. Okay, yeah. All right. Thanks so much. We'll see you on on the next one, I guess. See you guys. Thanks. Can I get another peek of that book? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>